like painting, I like doing clay, I like all of my artwork. This is one of my square drawings that I've done. This uh, drawing right here, it makes me feel good. And I show my inspiration. My name is o Jackie, and I'm going to take you on a tour. Mm -hmm. okay. And I show you the ceramic class. This is the wood class right here. <laughs> and they are sewing right here. What you sewing, the Lisa? My magic rope. Oh, OK. OK. Her magic rope, OK. And that's the teacher right here. How you doing? Art's a great equalizer that transcends language, that transcends culture, that transcends disability. Creative growth is about artistic expression as a form of self-empowerment, as a form of aesthetic development, as a form of saying, this is who I am in the world. Blue's cold and yellow's warm. How do you know when you're reaching in there what, what you're getting at? I can tell by the feel. The feel? Yep, the compartments, you know. When you so know, what when does the, the feel of green, what green, is that like? Greens feel like freezing. Red is hot. So you're working with freezing and hot right now? Yes. Monica has been fascinated with color ever since she was really a wee, a wee child. And I think losing her sight opened up a different connection to the world of light and shadow and color. Do you have a favorite foam shape to work on? I like, I like the logs, mm -hmm. the cubes, mm -hmm. the little tiny cubes in the spheres. Logs, tiny cubes, and spheres. Yeah, and the cakes, too. Yeah, the cakes turned out great. Yep. I see her becoming more and more dedicated to her art, and it seems to fulfill her in deeper and deeper ways. And for that, I feel so happy, you know, because she has so much to offer the world. Yes, Dorothy? Yes. Oh, yes, um, my name is Rosina Pinasta. <laughs> I'm from a, a small town in Louisiana, yeah. where all the poor people live at. That's where I'm from. This is the first type of art that I started doing. Creative Growth currently serves 162 artists in our studio every week. When people come to the Creative Growth studio, for the most part, they've never made art before in their lives, and, and we kind of welcome that, because it allows us to see who they are. And we, you know, there's no right or wrong. We don't teach in a traditional way. We say, you know, what would you like to do? What are you thinking about? What did you dream about? What color do you like? Tell us your story. I've been coming here since 1992. I like to paint. I like to draw. I like to paint some people, I like different people and stars, movie stars. There are wholesome people, wholesome encounters. What do you like to look at? I like that one. This one? Yeah. Look at that one, see what uh -huh. this one is? Yeah. This is what? What would you call this the name Black of this painting? The Inner Limits. William is just such a brilliant artist. And look at this beautiful piece. Do you remember making this? I remember. That's what, Praise, Praise Frisco? Praise Frisco, yeah. He envisions through his work a utopian reality that he creates for us all to live in. A world where people who have died have come back to life. Places where bad neighborhoods are safe. 
where his family is happy, where the world is peaceful. And he believes that the painting will be powerful enough to make that a reality. Riding on a spaceship, wholesome encounter spaceship, it's not going to be no more evils, no more aliens, no more monsters, no more evils. Uh-huh. Creative Growth is really a Bay Area story. The disability rights movement in the early 1970s, Creative Growth really comes from that. Uh, how big the drawing's gonna be, the picture. So during that time, people with disabilities and in institutions were suddenly deinstitutionalized. So artists came together in Oakland and put paint on a table and said, well, these people are gonna come here. Creativity is a path forward. <laughs> I'm just doing a tree right now. And people with disabilities can communicate and be a vital part of society. Part of the creative growth plan when you come here and make art is that we represent you and you show your work in the gallery. And if the work sells, the artist gets half of the money and creative growth, the nonprofit gets half of the money. We buy supplies and support the artist with that money. If you came to Creative Growth, you could buy something for $10 and you could buy something for $75,000. It's exactly like the contemporary art world. As an artist's work develops and it gets into collections in museums and is highly sought after, the prices go up. And Creative Growth artists follow that same path. Judith Scott is one of the most well-known Creative Growth artists. As an artist, Judith Scott transcended this difficult situation where she was separated from her family and institutionalized for almost 40 years. She was deaf and it wasn't known, so she never developed language, and she was isolated. So in her 40s, she comes to creative growth, and her method to talk to us was art. The process was very important to her, and the result of that process were these sculptures with hidden objects and accumulated protected things that were sacred or important to her. I think Judith Scott's role in contemporary art is that she's opened the door for a lot of people to see who an artist can be. Light bulb goes around, bring the long mat, right? Right. Pull it gently. You know, Dan's work is based on words. He builds literally words on top of each other to form his communication with the world. You want me to pull it down? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pull it gently, right? Right. Book about kit and let it go together, right? Right. We still don't know a lot about autism, but there's this big barrier there. There's this person behind this barrier, and he can't communicate in a way that you and I can communicate with each other and to put himself down on this paper. That's Danny's opportunity to talk to people. Dan's work has definitely progressed in the years he's been here. Dan became more and more interested in the graphic qualities of the letters, of how to use paint, how to use the brush, how to work on massive pieces of paper. He's very sophisticated. 
and he's a colorist. He's clear about what he wants to do. You know, and I think when you see that urgency in his work, it's because it's so important to him and because it's so important for us to know who he is, that he has thoughts like we do, that he's smart, that he's not to be dismissed. Dan Miller's in the Venice Biennale this year, which is this amazing achievement for him as an artist. It happens to be in the same room in the Venice Biennale as Judith Scott. So here are these two colleagues, their work looking right at each other, in a pavilion of contemporary artists who are using color in a powerful way. Not a pavilion of disability, not a pavilion of the self-talk, not a pavilion of the freak show. It's presented as an artist making a statement about the world today, and that's what they both did. They both have, like every artist, a history that informs who they are in the world today. We shouldn't need to exist. Dan should have gotten this in school, or William should have had this opportunity his whole life. It shouldn't be that creative growth has to be here for those people. I'm thrilled that we're here and we love our artists, but they should have access to creative outlets. It's a human rights issue to be diminished somehow, to be seen as not creative. When those prejudices go away, then our artists have the same potential to lead the culture, to be a part of our world, to inform me of who I am as a person. Look at all these people, who they're all coming back to new lives? Yeah, they're families. And what kind of lives are they gonna have now? They're, they're gonna they're have back? good lives. Uh -huh. They're gonna have a good life. Uh -huh. To learn more about Art21 and our educational resources, please visit us online at pbs.org slash art21. Art in the 21st Century, Season 9 is available on DVD. To order, visit shop.pbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. This program is also available for download on iTunes.